Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now it's time for plenary sessions. My name is Shigek Sugan from Waseda University. I chair this session. Today, we'll have plenary speaker, Professor Brad Nelson, Department of Robotics and Intelligence Systems, ETH Zurich, Switzerland. So as you know, he has great achievement in the field of micro, micro and nano robotics. In addition, he has a very unique careers, so including the uh, United, States, United States Peace Corps volunteers in Africa. So if you are interested in the, please read the biography of the Brad Nelson. So now I will introduce Brad to this stage. Brad, please. Okay, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's, uh, I, I left, I was a professor here at, at Minnesota uh, just about 10 years ago. And to, to be honest, coming here in May, I, was afraid, I still was afraid there was going to be snow on the ground. But, uh, uh, but we've had great weather. Uh, they're doing a good job with that, and, and it's been a, a, a great conference so far. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back here in the Twin Cities. Today I'm going to talk about robotics uh, in the small. Uh, I'd like to give a, a bit of an overview of kind of where I think the field came from, uh, and then what we've been doing uh, in this field over the past uh, 15 or, or so years. Uh, the first thing, though, is what do I mean by small? Um, of course, robotics spans a, a broad range of scales, uh, and there's some, some small-scale robotics that's getting very interesting. Uh, Vijay Kumar is the current rock star of robotics, uh, who's doing hand-sized helicopters, and of course Rob Wood's doing great things with, with even smaller devices. But we're going to talk about things that are even a little bit smaller. Uh, we're going to go from millimeters down to nanometers uh, in the next hour. And I want to uh, explain sort of where I... Where I uh, uh, where I, as I said, where I think this field has come from and, and where I also think it, it's going to be going or should be going uh, over the next decade or so. So um, uh, briefly, uh, sort of a, a history of robotics. I think if you, if you think back and you go back just 400 years ago, uh, there was a, uh, an invention that, that dramatically changed people's view of the world, and that was the optical microscope in, in Holland around the Netherlands. People were playing with little pieces of glass and realized they could see things that they never knew existed. Uh, like the uh, eyes on a fly and, and all sorts of things. And, and right away, people, uh, within a century anyway, or 75 years, people like Robert Hooke when he was at uh, Oxford, uh, just took these microscopes and wrote a very popular uh, book, by, not, not just for science, but for the general uh, population, on uh, what he could see under a microscope. And he drew, drew pictures of it, and it was one of the uh, major publications of the day. Around that time, uh, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek at, at, um, in Holland uh, also began to see, he wrote a letter in, in 1976 to, or uh, 1976, 1676 to the Royal Society in London, and he uh, said, I see these living things that we never knew existed. Uh, not just one or two, but tens of thousands in drops of water. And so all of a sudden people realized that there is a world that, that existed that we were really un, unaware of. And, and one of the people that first capitalized on that were the watchmakers. And that industry, a lot of that came out of, out of the Netherlands, came out of France, moved to Switzerland, Germany, uh, England as well. And uh, people realized these were tools we could use to make things, as, not just to explore nature and, and, and the scientific side of it. You go, fast forward uh, uh, several, several decades, and in, in the last century, uh, people started thinking, wh what are the physics, what are the dynamics of that? And, and there's a beautiful paper uh, that was lost for, for decades uh, in 1930 out of Germany that talked about uh, how these small uh, mechanisms, these small organisms must swim. There's something very interesting about the fluid dynamics that's foreign to us. Uh, 1952, Jeffrey Taylor at Cambridge uh, started to speculate on what kinds of mechanisms might, uh, might something like a spermatozoa there that you see in the, in the center image, uh, how they might, might swim. And he even speculated that things could have corkscrew motion, but it wasn't until 1973, which, you know, less than 40 years ago, that uh, Howard Berg uh, discovered that there's a rotary motor in bacteria and, the, and, and something that people hadn't envisioned, that, that nature could generate rotational motion 
in that sense. There was also a lot of interest uh, in manipulating small things with fields in the past, uh, past century. Magnetic trapping was also, also came out of Germany, was first uh, described in 1922. Uh, electrophoresis in the 30s, people looked at gels and things like that. And then uh, optical trapping in, in the 70s started to become very popular. And people uh, in, in robotics are act, still active in, in using these, uh, these technologies. Finally, um, as we get closer uh, on, on the manufacturing side, some other interesting things happened as, as uh, the, with the, the discovery of trans uh, semiconductor properties and, and the transistor, we started looking at how to make things smaller. That came about in the 1950s with uh, integrated circuit and uh, Kilby and Noyce are, are uh, some of the founders of that. And then a seminal paper was published in 1982 by Kurt Peterson called uh, Silicon as a Mechanical Material. And basically that was the idea, forget about the electrical properties of silicon, what can it do mechanically? It has some wonderful properties in terms of, of, of its mechanical strength as well as heat transfer capabilities. And so that brought about uh, things which we, we interact, every, probably every one of us has one of these in our pocket right now, accelerometers, uh, inertial sensors, uh, you'll see, uh, of course it's pressure sensors, all sorts of things. Uh, and that ushered in the, 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 the golden age of MEMS research was the, what, the 80s and the 90s. And then um, something happened in 1995 that I think, we, we're, from my perspective, that's when it became interesting for robotics. And, and uh, IROS was in Pittsburgh that year. That was also the same year I got my PhD, finished my PhD degree at Carnegie Mellon. And um, there was a workshop, and two very important papers appeared at that workshop. One was by Ron Fearing, and the other uh, authors were uh, uh, Fumihito Rai and Toshi Fukuda. And they started talking about uh, the mechanics, the physics that's going on at small scales when we start handling very small things, things that are smaller than a hundred uh, microns, smaller than a tenth of a millimeter, and starting to look at what are the physics involved. Now as a PhD student I worked in visual servoing force control and I thought, I uh, played with microscopes and thought about visual servoing uh, with microscopes, but, but it wasn't until I saw those papers that I realized that there was some very interesting research that could be pursued here, pursued here because the physics was so different and foreign to our in intuition. And, and that was a year I think a lot of people started talking about microassembly, becoming interested in how we might actually assemble uh, small devices rather than fabricate them in the, in the monolithic way that MEMS are traditionally made. Um, that also was the, the year 95 when I started building my lab and worked in there. And then in 1998, I remember a paper I saw by Tetsuo Rai where he used micro chopsticks to handle biological cell. And, and it, it struck me, what, a, what an interesting area to work on. It, to try to build robotics, micro-robotics that could handle cells. Uh, that also is the year I hired Son as a PhD student, and that was his PhD project, was let's figure out ways we can make robots handle biological cells. And we're still, a lot of us in the community are still working on that. Uh, and then uh, when I got to ETH after a year or two, started thinking about the, the next phases and, and began thinking about what if we could make small untethered devices to move through, through the human body. I didn't realize at the same time that Sylvain Martel was working on the same problem. Uh, only using MRIs, we came about it at a bit different pr approach, but that's kind of where we are in the field, I think, right now. So, um, what I think the primary impact of micro and nanorobotics has been so far in the field has been in micro handling, micro manipulation, micro assembly, lab automation. But over the years, as we started working in this, again, I, uh, 95 is to me is one of the seminal years when, when that workshop at IRIS, IRIS was held. Uh, we started working and, and, and thinking about uh, some of the technologies we needed to develop and some of the things that, that needed to be created there. And, and the first thing we realized was that we needed to create better and better sensors. But, the, but since that time, uh, what we've also discovered is that there's a real interest in the biological community for these kinds of devices and how we can use them to explore the biological world. And so we've worked on things like uh, understanding the dynamics of fruit flies and working with protein fibers and understanding their stiffness and material properties using robotics and automation as well to explore those properties uh, so that we can do many, many uh, statistically relevant uh, automated kinds of experiments. And that's been one of the, the important breakthroughs of, ro of, of robotics, understanding multicellular organisms like this uh, uh, nematode, this millimeter size C. elegans uh, nematode. Uh, down below, one of the most recent projects we started working on is, has been working on uh, an understanding how plants grow at a cellular level and how those cell, cell uh, wall stiffnesses and things like that change and, and uh, progress over time. So now we're starting to look at, at living organisms as they're growing and using our technology to do that. So one of the things that over the years it's been, been um, uh, uh, 
gratifying to me is to see that some of our technology is, is filling a niche and uh, has resulted in, in uh, companies that, that have a, de a demand for their products. So I, I've started giving more talks at biomedical conferences and everybody always gives their, um, what do they call their conflicts of interest. Uh, uh, and so this is a conflict of interest for me. I, this is a spinoff that came out of my company, or out of my, my lab and is one of our, uh, and I'm one of the founders of it. Um, and uh, it's a company founded in 2007, but, but we found there is a market out there. And the reason there's a market is because there was a gap when we entered this field. We, there was a gap in the technology. Um, atomic force microscopy, the, the AFM was invented just across the lake from me in Zurich. Um, uh, scanning probe microscopy came about in the early, uh, early 80s. The Nobel Prize was awarded in about the same year that the AFM was developed, which was 85, 86. Uh, and of course, we all work, uh, most as, as roboticists work with con conventional force sensors like ATI, the JR3, and these kinds of things. But there's a gap in that technology which we discovered quickly, and that's where we found that, that uh, robotics, micro-robotics can fill that, and that's where, where these kinds of, of uh, sensors and devices that, that uh, femtotool cells uh, fills that, that kind of a gap. But I think one of the things that's, that's holding the field back, or one of the things we really need to focus on as people like biologists use our tools, is that we need to think about calibration. I think calibration is one of the, uh, the, the real issues here. Um, what we would like to be able to do is take our four sensors and trace them back to that uh, golden uh, standard, that kilogram sitting somewhere in France that uh, we, defo we, we all accept as, as the true measure of what a kilogram is. And we would like to be able to take our, our four sensor there on the bottom and trace it back and understand all that uncertainty analysis to go back there. And, and that's very important when you're doing experiments and trying to compare results across labs. And if you look at the data in papers, you realize right away that there's a, there's a big disagreement in forces. And it's, it's really a calibration problem. And it's, it's maybe not the sexiest problem in the world to work on, but it's certainly an important one and one that's holding us back. And, and I think this is what the, peop the NIST of the world, uh, Germany's the standards, uh, Korea has a, has, has a, a uh, uh, standards community that, that works in this area, as well as the UK. Those are the four leaders working in, in trying to understand how force sensing uh, can be traced back for, uh, to, to even nanoscales. And so uh, doing these kinds of uncertainty analysis, I think, is, is one of the things that our community needs to be working on. That's about all I'm going to say about micro manipulation at this point until the very end of the talk. But right now, what I want to uh, move on to is, is where, where we were about 10 years ago and what we were thinking about. Uh, if you go back 10 years in the robotics community, or in, in the technology community, two products came on the market uh, back in 2001, I believe it was. Uh, one was, uh, uh, of course, uh, Intuitive Surgical's uh, very successful uh, uh, system. And the other was the uh, Given Imaging's uh, M2A camera pill, their, their endoscope, end, endoscopy pill. And, and both of those have been commercial successes, uh, uh, intuitive surgical more than uh, uh, most of us ever dreamed of, and, and it certainly turned a lot of heads in the um, uh, investment community. But the other thing that, that's interesting is, is how rapidly some of these technologies ended up getting developed once they were out there and how they were accepted. And the idea that uh, a surgeon's best skill is his judgment, his or her judgment, uh, whereas technology can be embraced by this community if it's fulfilling a need. Uh, and so we started thinking, what's the next step? If you go back 10 years, what, what are we going to do next? And, and I think the obvious uh, thing was thinking, well, we're going we're gonna to have robots swimming through our bodies, curing disease uh, in some autonomous fashion. And this is sort of the vision of nanorobotic, uh, nanorobotics, nanomedicine. It's, it's uh, a classic robotics problem. You've got, a, you've got a goal here that you're uh, uh, trying to reach, some, some sort of a disease, and you want to put devices, robots, that are going to navigate through this complex, uncertain environment uh, to there and somehow dispose of that. It's a classic robotics problem. It's got planning, control, learning involved. It has sensors, actuators, um, um, AI, everything, everything that you would want in robotics. What, what, uh, what's interesting uh, to me is that folks have uh, started thinking about this and started putting devices in body and tracking them as they go. And this image, what you're seeing is, is a uh, SPECT image, a single photon commuted, computed uh, emission tomography image. It's basically ra uh, carbon nanotubes of radionuclides put into the uh, vascular, vasculature of a rat, and it shows how those, those carbon nanotubes move through the veins and arteries of the rat and eventually are excreted after 24 hours. 
That's good. It, it means that the, the, the stuff isn't staying in there, but of course that's not what we want to do. We want to direct it to a target. We want to look at it from that direction. So that's where I think what a lot of us in the community are thinking, how can we achieve that goal? It's a, it's a very um, uh, ambitious goal and we're not sure exactly how to get there, uh, but we're making progress and, and have been making a lot of progress over the last decades here. But there's a lot more that this technology can do than just uh, targeted therapies. Of course, targeted therapies is the first thing that you think about, I think, and, and how can you uh, use devices in, that are intelligent that will, uh, that will move to these sources and, and cure diseases. How can you, uh, as we get, stem cells are, are actually starting to, you know, to be clinically uh, efficacious in, in certain cases, how can we get stem cells into the inner ear, onto the retina, into the heart, uh, into some of these locations where people believe that uh, they're going to start to look at, at how we can regenerate organs in, in new and different ways. Um, but there's a lot of other things you can do with this. You can, you can look at uh, controllable structures, inserting stents in a, in a less invasive way, or providing occlusions. That figure's a little hard to, to read, I realize, probably, but it, it's uh, uh, an operation in which uh, occlusions are put into the fetus in, in, in utero. Uh, and building tissue sta scaffolds. There's other things, too, like uh, biopsies, uh, ablation, or removing materials, sample and return kinds of missions, as well as uh, telemetry, things that are just searching your body, trying to for find, for instance, a source of blood in a colon, uh, trying to find the specific locations of diseases, perhaps finding uh, brain tumors while the cells are, are too small to image, but, but, but we can have some kind of a sensor. So I think there's a lot of ideas that can uh, come to, to bear on this, uh, a lot of things, with the, a lot of different uh, ways we can move in this direction. Uh, but, but I uh, always point out that there's a very long development time in this. If you look at the given imaging camera pill that came on the market in 2001 or thereabouts, uh, given imaging will tell you that the idea came to them 20 years before the, uh, the uh, founder of that company. But you can actually go back to the uh, literature. If you go back to Nature, we found a paper from 1957 where I, uh, at the University of California, San Francisco, they actually built a, uh, a little pill it didn't have a camera on it, but it did have telemetry. It can measure pressure and, and force as, as this moves through your body. So, so these ideas have been around for a very long time. How can we put things into our body and find these? And that's the kinds of things we're working on. Specifically, the, uh, the, the main application area of our work has been vitreoretinal surgery. Uh, if you ever have, have uh, we do this uh, several times a year go into and watch a, uh, an ophthalmic surgeon perform retinal surgery. It, it's an astonic feat of, first of all, steady hands, very, very steady uh, nerves. And um, uh, the dexterity that these surgeons exhibit is, is, is truly astounding. Um, they can achieve tens of microns of precision and, and they aren't really feeling any forces. They're just doing this basically by looking through a microscope and are able to, to tear delicate, delicate structures, target structures smaller than the width of a hair. Uh, with their device. So it, it's not surprising um, when you look at this and, and coming at this from a robotic standpoint that, that, that we think there's something that we might bring to that. And, and several robotics folks have, have thought about that. So, and, and here's a kind of a sample of some of the efforts that have been going on. Uh, one, one way to, to cl classify this would be surgeon extenders versus master slave systems. And, and Cam Rivera has been working quite for several years on, on uh, Micron, a, a tool that will cancel hand tremor and, and improve the, the dexterity or the, the steadiness of, of these operations. And, and that's uh, important and, and a uh, uh, has shown some, some interesting uh, capabilities there. Russ Taylor, Greg Hager, they've been working in, out of Hopkins on this as well. Uh, Russ has a, a system called Steady Hand where you basically grab the manipulator and use it sort of as a tool to uh, probe, probe this. Uh, out out from, the, from the Jet Propulsion Lab, more master slave uh, systems and Nabil Simone who's uh, at uh, Vanderbilt these days has also been looking at some of this technology. And so I think, uh, you know, we know robotics is good at high precision things, very repetitive things. So this is, this is a, a good, I think, interesting application area for us to work. But if you look at all of these technologies, they're, they're still uh, similar to the way it's currently done in the sense that you've got a tool that passes through the sclera, through the, the white part of your eye. Um, you've got this constrained motions at the trocar, so where, where it enters that membrane, you have a constrained motion there. These are position control devices for the most part. We're trying to bring, I know, trying to bring force sensors into them, um, but at this point, a lot of them are, are just uh, very high precision positioning devices. Uh, a vitrectomy is, re is required. That means they suck out your, your vitreous humor uh, in order to do these, and, and that actually can lead to other complications, almost uh, often cataracts and these kinds of things. Um, and uh, the invasiveness of this procedure is not necessarily reduced. 
So when we started thinking about this in, in consultation, I think Cam was one of the ones who, who first mentioned to us we should try to measure forces at these scales. Uh, we talked to, to, to Russ and Greg. Uh, they also uh, pointed us in this direction. We started thinking about different ways of approaching this. And so this is a, an old, old video. You probably, any of you seen my talks, you've probably seen it. Um, and, and this was our concept about uh, 2004, 2005 of what this device might do. You inject it into an eye, it travels in an untethered way through the vitreous humor, uh, finds something, in this case, a, a clogged retinal vein or artery, uh, injects some kind of a, an enzyme to dissolve that clot, uh, and then returns. And, and that's, uh, uh, it's amazing when you make an animation like this, how many people think you've actually done it. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things going on there that we did not even understand when we made this. Uh, and one of the first things we didn't understand, and nobody could tell us, was how much force does it take to puncture a vein? Uh, this is one, if you're going to build a system, you want specs as an engineer, and we didn't have any specs on most of these operations. So the first thing we did was we started looking at uh, how much force does it take to puncture a vein? Uh, and we go back now to the robotics manipulation technology we developed, which could measure, you know, micro to millinewton forces, no problem. Uh, we couldn't do this on humans, but uh, ophthalmic surgeons uh, take uh, chicks that are uh, uh, um, still in, in, the, in the egg, open that egg when it's about 11, 12 days old. And it turns out the veins in those chicks are very, very similar to retinal veins. So we, uh, we built a system, uh, measured lots and lots of puncture forces, uh, several hundreds of puncture fo uh, forces, and came up with some data to try to show where we were in terms of uh, micronewtons to millinewtons and, and make sure that we understood the forces that we were going to need to generate with whatever system it is that we could do here. So. Um, this has been the result of, of a lot of work. It's one publication, uh, 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 but it's a ton of work in the lab to try to understand this and develop the right kinds of technologies and the right uh, tools and a procedure to, to get some meaningful data out of these statistics. So, so we were uh, on our way and, and at least had some ideas on what kinds of forces we need to, to generate there. So. Um, how are we going to power this thing? This is one of the, the, the problems with, with microrobotics, and, and there were a lot of ideas. Uh, there still are a lot of ideas on how we might do this, but I think most of us in the community that have been working on it see uh, uh, magnetics, electromagnetic fields, and generating uh, uh, torques and forces using fields and field gradients. Uh, is really, really the, the, the approach to go. So if you look at those uh, two lower left uh, equations, the torque is, is a function of the magnetization of your device. And so the first thing we need to do is figure out what kind of material do we want? Something magnetic. Is it going to be uh, nickel? Is it going to be iron? Is it going to be some kind of a rare earth magnet? Uh, and so that's the first uh, uh, problem, is to try to optimize M in that equation, find the best magnetization, the best material. And so that's been also a, a huge effort in my lab. And I've got some excellent materials people, people like Salvador Pani, who leads a nice group uh, of, of electrochemists and materials folks there. And uh, we've looked at a, a variety of materials and published a lot of materials papers on how to you know, reduce remnants in cobalt nickel, uh, improve magnetic properties. Uh, and what kinds of uh, materials are, are going to work best for us. And so we've looked at a variety of materials. Here's, here's four of them right here, nickel, cobalt, nickel alloys, neodymium, iron, boron, and, and sumerium cobalt are, are some of the devices we've looked at. I'm not going to go into details on, on how we make those, but um, let me assure you there's a, a tremendous effort that goes on in trying to, to optimize those parameters there. And there's uh, the size of them on a fingertip. You know, we're looking at uh, millimeter to, uh, to submillimeter size uh, devices. The other problem besides the, the uh, material that you're going to be guiding is how do, you, how do you generate the fields themselves, okay? These externally generated fields. What's the approach? Uh, what you see in this picture are three electromagnets uh, uh, that, are, that we, we created but, uh, for this graphic, but why three? How many do we need? What's the minimum number? Are there some sorts of, uh, of issues there? And so one of the, the, I think, real innovative aspects has come out of my lab in the last year, few years, one of the... The, the, the important uh, things we were able to do was, was formulate this problem, and, and Jake Abbott, when he was in my group, uh, uh, led this effort where, in which we, uh, we were able to, to um, there's a lot of math behind this, and I'm not going to go into the details, but we were able to, to look at N electromagnets, each with a current, I, that goes through each of those electromagnets, and we can generate this, this uh, uh, matrix, this mapping that's a function of, of the position of your device in the workspace as well as its magnetic properties. Uh, and generate then this six by one uh, to force torque matrix, which we're all very, very familiar with. 
with some assumptions uh, on, on, on the way we're looking at this uh, uh, system and, and not going into saturation and, and these kinds of things. And so um, that helped us come up with some, some ideas on, on how to design it. Because if you, if you look at that a matrix, uh, what does it look like? It looks very familiar to our, our, our Jacobian matrix, which maps joint velocities to Cartesian velocities. And of course, uh, that was something that was presented back in 1985. It gave us a handle on how to use linear algebra and, and analyze these out of, of Professor Yoshikawa's uh, work in 1985. Uh, and that, um, then using singular, simple, you know, principal component, single value decomposition analysis led us try to optimize the configuration as well as the number of, of electromagnets. Our devices have five degrees of freedom. Uh, they're, they're rods, so they, they move in X, Y, Z, and they have two pointing directions, so we really only need five, but we, we, we lose a lot of control authority, uh, and we also can, can hit some singularities in, in the system, and by moving to eight, we can dramatically improve performance, and as we go beyond eight, it doesn't get there. So there's an engineering decision here that goes on, but I think what, one of the things that I really like about this approach is that when I was a master's student here in Minnesota, University of Minnesota, uh, a long, long time ago, 1986, as a matter of fact, uh, 85, 86. Uh, I was working on where, how do you place uh, assembly tasks in, in the manipulator workspace, and I had no idea how to get my head around this problem other than looking at oh, avoid joint limits and, and these kinds of things. And then, and then this paper appeared, and my, my uh, master's thesis advisor, Max Donath, uh, came to me after being at ICRA, gave me the uh, ICRA paper, and said, here, look at this. This might help you. And all of a sudden, it became clear to me. So I think these, uh, you know, sometimes it's that one paper that really gives you the, the, uh, the idea of how to approach this problem. And here I am, uh, many years later, uh, still, still latched onto this idea in a way. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of fun when, when you see your, your work coming back to something like that. So where are we um, uh, on this? We, we look at, uh, this is a, a nice uh, uh, graphic that uh, Michael Comer, my PhD student who did a lot of this work, uh, generated. And what it's showing you is it's showing you the vectors w in which the, the magnetic field is pointing, and then the red is, is indication of stronger fields, and blue is weaker fields. And so you'll notice the device is changing its orientation and moving uh, in, a, in a holonomic fashion with five degrees of freedom. It's not rotating about this axis. And, and so this is a system we can get our, 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 our hands on. And now not only does it tell us how to design system, it also tells us how to control them. And so this, this work from, from using redundant manipulators is coming back uh, in a very real sense. Sometimes people look at our robots and they, they say, there's nothing robotic about that. It's just a piece of, of um, metal. It's just a little piece of magnet. But they don't see the math behind it. And that's where the robotics, a lot of the robotics comes in. Um, there's a lot more to it than just generating the right fields and gradients, though. Um, and this, this is showing some of the vision part of the problem. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but uh, Christos Bergelis, who's, who's now at the Children's Hospital in, at Harvard in, in Pierre Dupont's group, uh, did a lot of the vision work for us. And, and here's uh, looking through uh, into a model human eye with the same dimensions and same optics as a human's eye, uh, human eye, looking through an optical, uh, an ophthalmoscope. Uh, and we're targeting, kind of voyaging through the, uh, the uh, ocular cavity down to the retina uh, and, and moving in, in a very... Um, uh, dexterous kind of manner. And the real limitation to the precision here is just how precisely you can see this with the ophthalmic microscope. The other thing that's very robotic about this is there's a, there's a theorem called Earnshaw's theorem which says you cannot have a staple equilibrium uh, point in a magnetic or an electric field. Um, that means you need feedback. And that was something that I worked on for my PhD, visual servoing. And there's a lot of people that have worked on visual servoing here. You have to have visual servoing in these systems. I don't use the word hardly at all, but everything is inherently visually, visually servoed. What, what this approach also lets us do is look at different uh, configurations of magnets, making some bigger and smaller to, to uh, uh, satisfy geometric constraints. We know how to deal with null space and how to, how to, de how to use the, the, those redundancies to, to, to design our systems differently and to control our systems differently. So there's a, there's a lot of robotics in, in this. Uh, and, and I want to uh, move into to this little video. Uh, uh, this was uh, Discovery Channel was out, uh, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago. Uh, Dean of Invention is one of their, their programs, and they, they filmed us uh, for this. I know Sylvain was on there as well. Uh, and what you're seeing here, actually, in this little video is from our lab. They did the animation, but this video is showing our device in a pig's eye. 
we go to the, uh, Christos went to the butcher early in the morning, brack, brought back the pig's eyes, and did, it, did experiments all morning in them. What you don't realize is that what Christos learned how to do is do a vitrectomy. He would suck out the vitreous from the pig's eye, put in silicon oil, just like an ophthalmic surgery does. And the reason is because the vitreous humor is a very nasty substance. It's, it's a viscoelastic material. It has collagen fibers in it. And this is one of the things we didn't appreciate until we got in there and started working with it. And so now the issue isn't just how to move through a Newtonian kind of fluid, but the issue is how to move through a gel through some sort of a network. And these are, are very cutting edge research problems now, understanding these viscoelastic nature of, of some of these. And, and it goes far beyond just the vitreous humor. It also, uh, uh, there, many tissues in the body have these kinds of properties. If you're going to do something in the brain, uh, in, in the liver, you're going to have to start thinking about these material properties. And we're just starting to scratch the surface there and understanding how these nonlinear properties change the way that uh, uh, we're going to have to think about how things move. One of the things we've been able to realize is now we can take our robot, our micro robot, put it in the eye, move it around back and forth, back and forth, and actually pull out properties. For instance, those numbers on the bottom tell me something about the damping uh, ratio within that, the, uh, within that substance. They tell me something about its, its viscous nature, its elasticity. Uh, and so we can go in, we can move around, we can learn how uh, that vitreous humor is different from species to species or, or even within humans and, and adjust our control strategies that way. Because as a matter of fact, uh, uh, when you're young, youngsters have more elastic, uh, rubbery kind of vitreous. And as you get older, your vitreous turns more watery. And actually, that's uh, one of those fortuitous circumstances because another thing that we've uh, spent some time doing is, is collecting donor eyes from, uh, actually go to the, we go to Bern on the train and, and uh, get some donor eyes uh, that are 12 to 24 hours after death. And when uh, we've, we've looked at, at individuals from 35 to 76 years old and, and the kinds of anecdotal evidence that the ophthalmic surgeons tell us we can actually measure with our system, which is, is true. What you see here is uh, one of our little, we call it micro robot. It's about a half a millimeter in diameter, about a millimeter long. Uh, moving through human vitreous. And so this is one of the, those times when you get lucky, right, where, where things work out to your advantage because a lot of the people that are suffering from the diseases we want to treat are older, and it turns out it's easier actually for our devices to move in there. And so uh, you'll remember I, I mentioned one of our, our prime motivators in building our system was to puncture these veins and to see how they, uh, what forces were, uh, were, were at work there. Uh, but then we, we uh, ran across, uh, uh, Brad Cradville helped uh, guide this, uh, uh, ran across some other types of therapies. Uh, one, age-related macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of blindness uh, in the Western world. Um, and it affects a, a, a huge percentage of the elderly. And it just gets, uh, as, as people get older, they have more likelihood. And you, you basically, uh, in, in the old days, uh, up until not too many years ago, people just cons would continue to go blind from it. But there are certain forms now that we can treat, and, and it's big business. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a few, couple billion dollars a year for a company like Roche to sell the drugs to treat this. But one of the, the new uh, treatments that's, that's just uh, ending clinical trials and, and is, is, is going to be uh, regularly used is something called an intravitreal insert. This is uh, from Civita Corporation in Waterton, Massachusetts. Uh, and what you see there is a, a device that's about 380 microns in diameter. It's about two and a half millimeters long. It's made out of polyamide, a kind of polymer, and inside of it, it has a drug called Lucentis. It's injected in through a needle. It just sits there for a three to six months, and it dissolves, uh, diffuses, uh, uh, dr this drug Lucentis off of it for several months and uh, tries to, to halt and, and can even, I'm told, at times reverse uh, macular degeneration. So now we've got a treatment and there's a, a, big, a big market for that. Now, of course, the, the, the idea is can we, can we do better with microrobotics? Can we get this device and put it closer to the source of the disease? Diffusion's a nonlinear uh, has nonlinear physics. In other words, if I could take that device and I could make it 10 times closer, if I could go for, say, say from 10 millimeters uh, away from the disease to, to a millimeter away from the disease, I can reduce the amount of drug I need by, by 100 times. And there are side effects from some of these drugs. And so if we can get things closer, we can, we can provide uh, a much uh, healthier dose, a much lower dose with the same kinds of, uh, uh, of, of treatment. And so that's been another effort in, in my group has been trying to build implants. Uh, in this case, out of cobalt nickel, we coat them with material like gold or polyperol so that they're biocompatible, non, or at least non-cytotoxic. Uh, non uh, and they're the sim very similar di uh, dimensions to the, uh, the alluvian insert that you saw previously from Civita Corporation. Uh, and we can, we can uh, make these of varying sizes. 
and they fit inside of a 23 gauge needle. What the advantage of that is, is that if you jab a needle in your eye that's 23 gauges and you pull it out, you don't have to put a, a suture in it, uh, okay? So it's a sutureless injection. Uh, it's it's fairly, uh, fairly non-invasive, although it doesn't sound like it. The other thing that uh, is, is nice, we can put uh, devices on the end of it. Again, remember, this, is, this device is, is uh, 300 microns or so in diameter. The, that vessel that's puncturing is about 125 microns in diameter, a hair width or two. Uh, in, in dimensions, and we can puncture veins with it. Even though now we're not really concerned so much with puncturing veins as just moving there, we still have the same kind of force authority. So what's the next step in this now is to try to look at this in living animals, and that's where we are right now. We started animal trials a few weeks ago uh, with rabbits at the animal hospital in Zurich. Um, and uh, this is our, our current version of our Octomag, which we poured out to the, uh, to the animal hospital. It's uh, a few minutes by tram uh, away from us. And uh, here's one of the first uh, uh, in vivo uh, examples of a um, uh, micro-robot being injected into a living animal. This is a, 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 the, the needle looks a little big. It's actually a 22-gauge needle, uh, but we can go 23, maybe even 24 with some of our devices. And so what you'll see here as you're looking through the, uh, through the eye is a magnified version of that micro-robot sitting uh, sitting in a, in a rabbit, and one of the things that I am ex super excited about here is that this rabbit has not had a vitrectomy. Its vitreous is intact. R pigs were not good. They had very bad vitreous. Uh, but, but rabbits, we find their vitreous is more similar to what we uh, uh, see in humans, and we're able to actually move within this uh, uh, to the retina and, and move this device around uh, with, with high dexterity. Uh, and um, uh, with the, with the vitreous uh, uh, intact. So, so where are we with um, uh, our ophthalmic micro-robots? Well, right now, uh, we've, we've developed a robot that's capable of, of moving throughout the eye. Uh, it moves with micron precision positioning, and it has inherent force feedback. And the reason it has inherent force feedback is because the currents we put through our system directly translate into force on there, and we can directly pull that number out. There's no kinematic chain to go through or anything, so we know precisely, once it's calibrated, what those forces are. So force feedback is an inherent part of this. Um, the injections require no suture. We can make them small enough so that you just put it in you, and you can bring it out. And, and also, I'll, I always get this question, so I'm going to answer it now. Uh, these devices can be taken out. Christos can tell you how he, he used to do it all the time, but we take a magnetic needle, bring it near it, and, can, and pull it out and, and remove the devices that way. Um, potentially no vitrectomy. I'm not ready to say that yet, but everything right now that we're seeing points to the fact that we can move within vitreous intact, and I think that's a big win for this technology. And uh, the, the first technology, we were originally looking at retinal vein occlusions and getting rid of those clots, but right now we're more focused on the drug delivery and target uh, as our target theory, but we think there's a lot of other applications for this. Uh, a lot of folks, as they get older, start to develop uh, epiretinal membranes on, and they get macular puckering. Uh, we're thinking about ways of, of, of dealing with that. Uh, uh, retinal implants are starting to be out there, ways we may be able to, to help in the implantation of those and get them situated right. Uh, I think there's a lot of different things that we can do with this technology, and we're just starting to scratch the surface, um, and we're, we're continuing on. So the next step for us is uh, building a clinical size version. And so this is a, a fully designed, uh, been through all the finite element analysis, all the magnetic field generations, everything system that's able to generate these same kinds of fields and gradients uh, within a human head. Uh, we call it the ophthomag now. But it doesn't only reach the eye now, we can actually reach the, uh, a structure that's the same as the entire head there. Um, and uh, where we are right now is, is, is uh, in, in the, the process of, of uh, well, to be honest, uh, we've got the design. Uh, today I actually have a proposal due to try to get money to, uh, to build it. So uh, not only do I have my keynote or plenary talk today, I also have a proposal due today. So, uh, um, but that'll uh, hopefully get this system started for us. We're also thinking of going bigger, and, in, and, and this is a system which is actually being built in my lab right now. It's a, it's a whole body size magnetic manipulation system built on that. Uh, this, the, the technology I showed you earlier that allows us to uh, 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 design uh, various configurations and look at the fields and gradients we can generate in there. What you'll see in this is, uh, this is a C-arm, this is a, fluoros a fluoroscope uh, C-arm that, that will look through the patient and be able to guide these devices up to about a half a, a millimeter, a 500 micron precision. 
And, and the application we're looking at for this is, is actually somewhat of a popular application these days in cardiac ablation, steering catheters into the heart and helping uh, several people have, have heart problems, a uh, problem with atrial fibrillation where their heart is not beating properly. Cardiac uh, surgeons uh, and, and electrophysiologists have figured out ways they can actually put the heart back into the right rhythm by, by uh, basically destroying parts of the heart tissue at particular locations and, and create a, a proper beating again. One of the issues is how do you get in there? And of course, a lot of folks are working on different technologies. This is one we think might work, but then other folks are working on uh, uh, catheters that are uh, you know, serpentine kinds of, of structures and things like that. So this is where this technology is for us right now. We've also taken this technology and gone smaller with it. We have a, a microscope sized device and it lets us do some fundamental research in fluid dynamics at, at micro and nano scales and guiding small devices. So magnetic traps I mentioned before first were reported in 1922. This is a magnetic trap that allows, that, that doesn't just move in X, Y, and Z, which is what all of them had done before, but this actually moves with five degrees of freedom, potentially six, if we can magnetize the radial axis on this. So this is a, a, a new kind of, of magnetic trapping device as well. So, so let's go back and um, remember where we were. We've got this system now. It, it borrows technology from uh, redundant manipulators. It borrows technology from visual servoing. Um, but it's, it's based on some fundamental physics. And the physics uh, is not working on our side as we go smaller. smaller. We've got forces and we've got torques. Uh, the first thing in this equation that bothers me is that the volume of the material, that is the little micro robot, is, is in this equation. So as I make my robot 10 times smaller, the force goes down by 1,000. If I make it 100 times smaller, it's a million. That's not good, okay? The other problem with this equation is we've got a gradient. We're, we're always moving in the direction of stronger fields, in a spatial gradient term here. And it's hard to generate large gradients over long distances. MRIs are great at generating very, very large fields, but they have very small gradients, so they cannot generate large, large forces. So, so uh, things aren't on our side here. Um, I should mention that this, this, this technology, though, this approach is, is patented and is licensed to, uh, to Ann Scientific, which is uh, another spin-out from my group, and, and so they're turning this into to products, and they're the ones building, for instance, the, uh, the cardiac ablation uh, system, and they're the ones also that have designed the um, ophthalmic, uh, the Optomag, the human-sized system for that. So what do we do when we can't, uh, we, we don't know what to do? Uh, well, a good thing to do is, is be bio-inspired, look at nature, and, and of course people have realized this now uh, since Van Leeuwenhoek that small things are moving at small scales, and it wasn't until the 1930s that, uh, that people started thinking, how can that happen? Uh, and it wasn't until you know, 1973 that uh, uh, this rotary motor here uh, at the bottom, uh, and, and these uh, E. coli bacteria, that this is a video from Howard Berg, I, I didn't, forgot to put the, um, citation on it, that, that uh, these rotor mo rotary motors exist. So we started looking at this technology, uh, and uh, these, these motors are, are phenomenal. They're 45 nanometers in diameter. They generate hundreds, even thousands of RPMs, and uh, they make bacteria, uh, motile bacteria like E. coli, salmonella, some other types uh, move, and they're, they're made out of about 35, 40 different proteins, and they self-assemble into this, this phenomenal structure driven by proteins, protons. Uh, driven by uh, uh, hydrogen ions flowing across them. So we started looking at, at bacteria though and we noticed uh, from a paper uh, out of Berg's lab that the flagella uh, that he was making w w looked astonishingly similar to one of the nanostructures we had just learned, figured out how to fabricate this helical structure and they were al almost the same size. Uh, we, one of the, the things that uh, Li Zhang uh, in my group has, has really pioneered for us has been uh, looking at this self-scrolling technique where we take very thin nanometer layers and get things to roll up into very pr uh, precise patterns. And so basically we put down different stressed layers. We can, we can then very precisely control the, the, the uh, uh, shape of these devices. And so we, we came up with this idea for what we call artificial bacterial flagella. Uh, they're they're uh, devices that are uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 nanometers or microns in length. They're, they're very similar in scale to uh, bacteria with their flagella on them. The one thing we did to this, this uh, scroll though is we added this little piece of, of um, metal, this little piece of uh, nickel uh, magnetic material on the end of it. And 
we can't make 45 nanometer motors, but we can generate rotational motor motion with that. But one thing I wanted to point out uh, in this, uh, which is kind of funny, is one of my students was in Germany uh, just before Christmas and was looking through the bookstore, and we, he, he was looking in the, the Guinness Book of World Records, and we discovered that we're in the 2012 Guinness Book of World Records uh, for, I think, the, uh, what, the smallest or something most useful. You can read it better than I. I can't see it from here. Uh, mini robot uh, that's been made. So if Guinness Book of World Records says it's true, it must be. Um, we had no idea where we were in there, actually, to tell you the truth. I kind of remember an email um, from them about asking for a picture, but uh, so they, we, they've uh, uh, honored us in that way. So we've got the, the smallest robot uh, uh, there. But um, what do we do? How does this work? So we, we, uh, we take these, these uh, devices, and we basically build these, this Helmholtz. This is a three-axis Helmholtz coil. We can generate an arbitrary field, and we can rotate that field. I don't care about gradients anymore. Uh, I have very low fields, two millitesla. This is a thousand times lower than an MRI. All I have to do is make it, make it rotate. And I can generate this kind of corkscrew motion uh, that, that swim, sim, swims similar to bacteria. Uh, these things generate small forces, small torques, uh, but they have actually full six degree freedom control. Uh, and they're almost holonomic. Uh, uh, there's a little, uh, uh, in, in certain ways, we can, we can move them uh, um, in, in very interesting ways through there. Um, and so you, you remember this process was based on, on these thin layers, and that's a very difficult uh, uh, process to tune and to get things uh, properly, uh, properly grown and, and get these layers uh, in, in, in the right organ uh, configuration. The other thing is this is all derived from the semiconductor in, uh, industry, all these processes. So the kinds of materials we're looking at are silicon, silicon germanium, indium, gallium, arsenide. These are things you definitely don't want to put in your body. Uh, and so we started thinking, is there, is there a way that we can make biocompatible uh, ABS? Can we use some kind of a polymer that's biocompatible here? And so um, we, we had ideas, we worked for a while, and then uh, stumbled across a process called two-photon photopolymerization. And basically, you can very precisely focus a laser beam within a polymer and, and cure that polymer and build these very, very tiny structures. Now, lucky for us, somebody had already turned this into a product, unlike in, with femto tools, we didn't have to develop it. And out of Germany, there's a company called Nanoscribe, and you can buy one of these now. They just came on the market a year or two ago. Basically, you program whatever shape you want, and it will go through just like a rapid prototyping machine, only at the nanoscale. Uh, to make some of these, these, these devices. And so this is the procedure we've developed. We also discovered that if we, uh, uh, we can make these same kind of helices that were, that were a bit of a, a, a challenge for us in a, in a normal fab, we can make them very rapidly. And by coating them with a simple evaporation procedure, we can coat them with nickel to give them magnetic properties, put a layer of titanium on top to give them biocompatible properties. And uh, they have magnetic properties. They have these but cells. Uh, this is, these are mouse, uh, mouse cells. Uh, that will grow on them and, and proliferate on them. So they're, they're clearly not cytotoxic, and uh, they, they seem to even and thrive in a way on there. So we've been able to, to, in a surprisingly easy way, and of course it wasn't easy to the, the masters and PhD students who had to do it, but, but much quicker than I anticipated, we were able to get biocompatible ABFs uh, in polymers this way. And, and this is from um, Toichiro. Uh, a new PhD student uh, in my group from the uh, University of Tokyo, and this is a nice video he made called Synchronized Swimming. These guys are about a half a hair width in length uh, and uh, rotating and moving. Um, and we still don't fully understand the fluid dynamics of this, and we work with some, some very good fluid dynamics. Some of the top people in the world uh, discuss these things with them, and there's still a lot that's not understood about, about the fluid dynamics. Uh, of what we're seeing and, and the magnetic interactions here, but, the, but it clearly works. The other thing that's kind of cool about this is we can actually start adding end effectors to this. I couldn't do, in a, in a fab, this would be really difficult to do, but now since I have uh, 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 this uh, 3D kind of rapid prototyping system, we can start adding, for instance, a claw. We can grab, uh, and, and have demonstrated this, uh, there's a, a Picture, or pic, a picture on advanced materials of our device, grabbing, you know, micron-sized and releasing these objects. Uh, uh, using this kind of technique. One thing I've been ignoring about all of this, and I just have to say this a little bit, is, is the fluid dynamics at these scales. Uh, Reynolds number is, uh, if, if you're a mechanical engineer or physicist, you know it very well, it tells you uh, a lot about the fluid dynamics. Uh, at the top is high Reynolds numbers, it's turbulent, it's what airplanes uh, uh, see, it's the way we swim. At the bottom is low Reynolds number, things that flow very, very smoothly, things like honey. 
Uh, we live uh, in, a, in a higher Reynolds number regime. Bacteria, these microorganisms, live in a small, uh, a very low Reynolds number machine, and that regime, and that completely changes the fluid dynamics. It completely changes everything that's going on. Uh, we're in a Stokes low regime, but I think, uh, but but we have this nice linear nature where our our uh, uh, rot uh, forward and, and rotational velocity. Uh, uh, transmit through this this uh, linear uh, matrix to uh, to forces and torques that this is generating. So there's, there's a nice cl uh, cleanliness to this uh, to the math here. But one of the things that's that's uh, that's not so obvious though is that you can't have a reciprocal motion. You cannot uh, the way we swim we just go over and over reciprocal motion. You have to have something that's non-reciprocal, some kind of a strategy where you're you're not going through the exact same sequence time and time again. Something that's that's non-reciprocal, uh, and that's been the conventional wisdom uh, in this field. Uh, until we, we started thinking about things and playing in the lab, and again, this is uh, Li Zhang, uh, do we really need reciprocal motion? And we realized as we got near surfaces that, that these surfaces, there, there's actually a slight change in drag, and that breaks the symmetry that we've seen. And so now taking, forget about these, these complicated structures, we can actually take simple structures like rods, like nanowires, and we can get them to move, and we can actually get them to move in 3D over these surfaces just by simply rotating the field. And, and this is something that, that people never talked about before, and it's one of those really simple ideas, but it took a long way to get there and to understand the implications of it. Then we started thinking about this in more detail, and we started wondering, is there a way that we can, um, wh what's going on as we rotate? And we realized some kinds of micro vortices are being generated. And so what, what we've discovered then was that these micro vortices actually are a type of fluidic trap that will stable, as we're rotating, that will stably pull particles into them. So we go back now to 1922 using magnetic traps. We go to electrophoresis, so you had to have a magnetic material. We had to electrophoresis uh, required some electrical properties, optical uh, 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 trapping also required that. But what we have now is we use a tool that's magnetic to grab something that's just about the right dimensions, but its material properties aren't aren't uh, important. And so this is a, a completely new way of trapping and manipulating structures that, uh, that, was, that came out of, uh, of, of our group. And again, here, is, here we are with a bead. What you don't see is, is right next to the bead on the outside of that circle is the little nanowire that's, that's really rotating and moving around this using visual servoing to guide it uh, through this structure. So we've got a, a new uh, 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 way of, of trapping and manipulating small particles. Uh, and, and guiding their motion, or I should say small rods at these scales. And so uh, I mentioned, coming back to my materials guys, we've worked a lot on, on nanowires and, uh, we're, and working with them so that where we are, the state of our art right now is that we can take iron, which is fairly biocompatible. Um, we can coat it with gra thin layers of graphene, which is a very hot topic now, Nobel Prize a few years, a couple years ago in, in that. And we can functionalize these, these devices now, and we can also make them move and rotate. Um, and so that's where we are with a lot of this has been um, uh, as we go to smaller and smaller scales and go down to the nanoscales as we've taken these magnetic nanowires, coated them with carbon nanotubes or actually layers of graphene, we can functionalize that. We know the chemistry of that and, and attaching molecules to it. And now we have a way of uh, actually guiding these perhaps through vessels. Uh, even though the physics is not on our side when we use fields and field gradients, as we use rotating structures, now all of a sudden we have a way of making these things move that we never would have dreamed of before we started this project. We have ways now uh, with low fields, like I said, these are you know, two millitesla fields we're working at, very low, just rotating fields, guiding these things and making them move in different directions. Okay, so I'm coming to, uh, coming to the end here. Uh, what I've shown you are, are a couple different robotics, you, and what I, you might not have appreciated is the vast difference in scale here. Uh, the, the ophthalmic robots are millimeter uh, size or so. The small bacteria-like uh, robots are, are much, much smaller. Uh, with the bigger things in the body, fields and gradients, we're able to generate the kinds of forces, so certainly in the eye and we think in, in other parts of the body that can do something very interesting and, and uh, you know, in a very non-invasive way. But as we go smaller, we want to look at rotating fields and, and how we might move things there. And so, uh, you know, the big win here is that we can go to lower fields. We don't care about gradients. We just need to be able to control those and move them. And so these are, it's kind of a circuitous path, but we, 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 we've learned a lot along the way as, we've, as we progress through all these experiments. So to summarize, um, you know, I, I'd say the primary application area, at least that we're focused on in micro nanorobotics, is, is typically in medicine and biology. We're looking, we work with a lot of biologists, we work with a lot of surgeons, we have a lot of doctors uh, that, that we work with in different areas. Um, 
And, but it's really uh, uh, been in the past decade, I think, that, that our field of micro and robotics has tried to, started to understand how to solve some of these problems in how to power uh, locomote and fabricate at these scales. And, and I think this is a big breakthrough, and it's, it's happened relatively rapidly if you take a long view of it. Uh, we're starting to think of appropriate therapies, and it's actually surprisingly easy for me to get uh, doctors to come uh, to our lab uh, and to, to have meetings with it once a month, talk about different therapies. Um, they don't laugh at us. They don't call us, uh, you know, it's not science fiction anymore. When they see these systems working, they realize it's giving them some capabilities. Um, it's, it's a huge potential. The, the timeline's a bit uncertain, although it's getting more, more and more certain now. I'm starting to see paths uh, where these can go into clinical trials. I'm starting to see uh, uh, doctors that we can work with. And, and certainly we're starting to see, as we work with companies like Ann Scientific uh, and investors, that people are willing to, 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 uh, to invest some money, at least initially, to see, to see where this technology is going. Um, but I think it's a field that's still very much in its infancy. If you look every year, it seems to change. We seem to learn something new. Somebody's learned something new. We're trying new ways of making things move, uh, imaging and all sorts of things. I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that. So, so the, the, the final uh, uh, couple slides are just one more thing I want to mention is where, where is this field going to go? I mean, where, what's the ultimate? And if I were starting my career over again and I were building a lab, I think it would be fascinating to try to understand how to build self-assembling micro-robots based on, on nature as a, a, as a template. Uh, DNA is software, okay? It just tells us how to make proteins. Proteins, if they're designed properly, assemble themselves into complicated structures, okay? And here's the bacteria motor I was talking about. And here's what uh, the, the geneticists and the molecular biologists kind of think is what's going on in this assembly process. We're starting to understand it. We can mimic some of these structures, maybe not the whole motor, but certainly some of them. And I think there's, there's a lot of uh, capabilities that, uh, uh, that are, are, are going to come out of this. And so um, I, I like to, uh, to remind you of a, of a quote uh, that, uh, from Richard Feynman, which says, uh, what I cannot make, I do not understand. And I think if you can make a bacterial motor, you've understood it. We still don't know, or the, the geneticists still don't agree on, on exactly how this thing is made, but they do know all the components of it. And uh, I think, you know, this is kind of the synthetic biology uh, direction, but I think there's a lot to do. And I think robotics has a lot to bring to this. So uh, I'm going to end it there. Uh, I want to show the most important slide last, which is the great team I have and the vast range of skills that are in that group. And, and uh, uh, I only know very little of what's going, uh, very little uh, detail. I know a, little, a lot about a, little, a lot of things, but there's, there's experts in all these fields that are helping us there. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the single hand talk and the very interesting videos. And now I will accept several questions from the floors. Are there any questions? Toshi. So will you please start to bring the microphone on here? Uh, Brad, thank you very much. So fa Excellent. fantastic work. Okay, fantastic border voyage like that. Thank you very much. Such a kind of fantastic voyage to such a robotic uh, scientist. Uh, this is uh, so nice. Uh, also kind of the future. But uh, you mentioned those uh, biomedical kind of uh, research field, but also those kind of uh, micro-robotics, nano-robotics, give um, another paradigm, also like a kind of material like that. Say like a low, low, super low friction also thing for kind of industry way, of course, many, many things, also like uh, uh, some kind of communication, kind of uh, uh, super, super sort of uh, modulation in communication, something like that. Also kind of laser beams, there are so many other kind of things. So uh, perhaps those things can be used in your micro robot or nano robot, mm. I guess. That's okay. Can you comment more about it? Because, uh, I'd like to uh, listen more about such a micro-robot with a sort of a little bit more intelligence. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the, some of the most exciting work in, in the domains you're looking at are, are related to self-assembling, self-organizing systems. Uh, you know, folks like Carl Boringer and, and, and folks that are looking at ways of getting systems to put themselves together. Uh, 
uh, and people are looking at, at electronics that can grow uh, and, and these things. And I think there's a, there's a lot. And again, there's a lot that this community can bring to that, I think. So uh, I think, you know, if I were to, to target one specific area, I think self-assembly will just can ch change very much of that. So, yeah. Brad, um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I was uh, looking with interest at the video of the small uh, uh, robot puncturing a blood vessel. Yep. And uh, one thing came to mind is that in the, I think in the 90s, there have been some works on detecting the instance uh, when you puncture through the uh, retina. Yep. That was in the context of, I think, Ed Colgate's work on uh, haptic feedback. Um, when you look at these robots, uh, can you actually use the magnetic field and vision for uh, some kind of a force feedback? On, uh, and also, if you have a, a, a quick removal of force when you first puncture the blood vessel, what would be the... Uh, have you guys looked at the dynamic response of the robot? Will it be able to stop or will it just go through? Yeah, I, well, if you look at these, this is uh, every puncture, I think, that we, we look at the video afterwards, we always puncture it before we think we do as we go back and look at it. Um, so, so the forces we're applying are constant, and, and then basically what you're going to see is, is a jump. Uh, you're going to have to visualize that. So you're going to look at your vision. From your vision, you can pull out when your, your dynamics have changed, and, and you have to look at that as a puncture. Um, I think that's something to look at. I, 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 like I said, I think every time we puncture a vein, we do it before we think we did, and I think it's actually easier than we... Uh, we think, uh, we think it is. But uh, Yuho, my student, who's done uh, hundreds and hundreds of these punctures, does them all by hand, and uh, he likes to work very late at night to do that. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks for the brand new uh, lecture. And I was just wondering how, it is, how difficult it is for, um, uh, to go for, from these ophthalmic applications where you can benefit from the visual feedback to other districts uh, where, I mean, you mentioned the uh, total body applications yeah. just by scaling the, the field, but controllability may become an issue. And so I just have, would like to have your comments on that. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons we started with ophthalmology. Uh, and the number one, it was, one of the, the biggest was, we, well, it was, I think it was a good application area, but also I didn't have to solve the localization problem. I mean, essentially, we had an ophthalmoscope. We, we know computer vision. Uh, Christos uh, did a lot of great work on, on the vision side of it, and there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. Greg, Greg's working in that area as well. Um, I mentioned I have a proposal due today. Well, that proposal has in it also uh, not a human uh, size, but also a fluoroscope. And so that's exactly where we're going, is trying to, to, to look at that. We're also looking at uh, uh, low field MRI uh, approaches as well. So, so we're, we're thinking that, but you know, um, we can't solve, we, we, we tried to bite off a problem we thought we could chew uh, and, and then move on. And that's where we are, but you're exactly right. The localization problem is a big one still. So. The navigation uh, results are very impressive. Do you think you'll be able to get high enough forces to do mechanical repairs inside the heart and the blood vessels, things like repair valves or fix aneurysms, you know, sort of Newton-level forces? Yeah, well, that's why there's a tether. <laughs> uh, you can push, right? uh, and you can, you can um, uh, the catheter gives you some of that. Um, no, I don't think that it's going, it can go, you know, it, it gets very hard to do this over, over long distances. Uh, but we always get surprised. Something we didn't, you know, um, I think we have a, a potentially, uh, I mean, according to the doctors, I think the, the application we're looking at for ca catheter of uh, cardiac ablation uh, is a good one. Um, once we get in there, I think there's going to be more we can do with it. And we've already talked to uh, folks about implanting stem cells and, and some of these other things in the heart. So I think um, a lot of this stuff I honestly have some faith in. Uh, nobody knows exactly what all the problems are, but we know they're good problems and there's a lot that we can do. So maybe, maybe we'll find different ways of doing this or combining this with other approaches. Um, but yeah, forces are, are the bane of, of, of this and uh, we're well aware of that. So. Thank you. Thank you.